Shia LaBeouf is known for his erratic behavior that stops the internet and gets people talking. But in the past few years, it seems like he's calmed down from making viral moments and is focused on himself and just making movies. But recently, it was just that, a role in a movie that seems to have rocked his worldview, which leads us to a very interesting conversation. Does life imitate art? or does art imitate life? In this video, we'll be reacting to the details of the story and if this new world you change is here to stay or if he's just method acting. Bruce Lawn. Now, this isn't an endorsement of Shia LaBeouf, nor is this going to get into the minutia and the details about Catholicism and Protestants and that whole bit. There's awesome resources available for that. I'm actually gonna have Trent Horn from the Council of Trent YouTube channel on next month in person for our podcast. So make sure you're subscribed to the Bless God Studios channel and a Patreon. But if you wanna hear those details, Trent Horn, Mike Winger, they've gone back and forth on some of this stuff. There's plenty of resources around that topic in particular. We're gonna be discussing Shia LaBeouf's apparent new conversion to Catholicism. What led up to that? What were some of the things he's dealing with? And the question under the question of how do people land in these places? There's the reality of art imitating life and life sometimes imitating art, but there is a deeper principle here that I think many of us can gleam a lot of wisdom from when we consider all the variables. Let's jump right in. This is from Bishop Robert Barron's channel. It's an hour and 20 minute interviews. I'm going to play about four clips to kind of give us some context on what happened. And if you're here and you're enjoying us so far, make sure you smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. It really, really does help. Okay, let's jump into this clip. This is about the 451. Wind up with this, this task. And the task is to play like one of the most spiritual men that ever lived. You're playing um, one of the most respected, beloved saints that ever graced the earth. S some people in, in you know, Italy don't carry a Jesus on them, they carry a Pio on them. <laughs> yeah, right. You go to certain places in, in Italy and he's everywhere, he's Elvis. You, you recognize rightly that this is more than a role, that this is, Pio's interesting. Um, so he gets an opportunity to play Padre uh, Pio or a priest named Pio. I'm not super familiar with the story and apparently this was made into a movie. And so he is talking about the reality of having to play someone that Catholics consider one of the most spiritual people, a saint, so on and so forth. And it's his preparation for this that leads him to faith and converting to following Jesus. Okay, now let's check uh, at the 18 minute mark. There's some more stuff that he reveals that's really interesting. You know, I walked yeah, into yeah. this, my life was on fire. I was walking out of hell. It wasn't like I, you know, I willingly came in here on a, on a white horse singing uh, show tunes. I came in here on fire and, and I didn't want to be an actor anymore. And my life was a mess, complete mess. And I had hurt a lot of people. And I felt deep shame, deep guilt. I didn't like to go outside much. I really, like, I had a, I had a, a yearning not be here anymore. You know, I was is on my it, way out. Is that where you were when you yes. accepted the role yes. of every appeal? So this is why when you spoke about the role, I wanted to kind of dive in there because it's kind of formative to how this all happened to me. I was willing because pain made me willing to go about this in a different way than I had previously. You know, my- That's interesting. He said, pain made me willing to go about this in a way that I hadn't before, in a different way. And I remember way back when I was in high school, I had a high school teacher named Tambo, and he said the only time people change is if they're hurt or scared and sometimes if they're bored. But generally, it's the pain and it's the fear that will help us to have that different perspective to be willing to do something different in how we're trying to live our life. And so he, he owns that right here. My opinion about God before this happened, before the pain struck, before my world had crumbled, was art, love, and God, they all mean the same thing. They're synonymous. And and goodness gracious, isn't that true in today's society in many ways? People conflate what is artistic, what is feel good, what is my truth, so on and so forth. This happens all the time in so many uh, circles and even the type of things that we're willing to consume as followers of Jesus is done in the name of art. The type of things we're willing to tolerate is done in the name of art. And he's saying, look, art and God was the same thing to me. It's pretty heavy artist who creates art, I found myself in a godly position often, right? Where I was in charge. Mm. And I had also been told my whole life, like, your life is your life. You have to make with it what you can, you know? You gotta be a good guy and then you gotta get married and then you gotta get a house and you gotta get a job and do good at your job. And like, your life is your life and yeah. things will work out if you put effort in and, you know, um, it's up to you. Mm. And I always really felt that. 
and it made it hard to believe in God. Because he felt like he was his own little God. He felt like being a celebrity, being famous, being someone affluent, being someone that people gleamed on was his own little deity. And so it's very difficult for people in places of power, of authority, of wealth to see their need for a God. And my ego is what makes me research PO. It's not my Catholicism or my yearning so towards God. So it's always a cool role for me to play. Great, okay. now I can get back on the horse. Mm. Yeah, okay. And so I start researching PO. And, and as I'm researching PO, he tells me about his plans to make a movie and he tells me that Willem Dafoe is gonna be in the movie. And now I'm really an ego. Wait, so I can go from bottom barrel to working with Willem Dafoe? Ah, this is my chance, you know, back on the hustle, back on the ego. Yeah, yeah. And I start leaning into this thing and he says, well, if you wanna do this role, I need you to start researching. Go up and find a, um, I need you to go find a seminary. A well, Catholic and that's when seminary. you made your way up to San, uh, San Lorenzo. So, so the closest seminary to me yeah, yeah. living in Pasadena was San Lorenzo. So yeah. I drive up there and I park my truck and I start living in the parking lot. And I'm immersing myself in this world and I'm sending videos back to to Willem and Abel, who at the time were, you know, working on the script, and I'm falling into um, a, a group of men that met me in San Lorenzo, namely a guy named Brother Jude, who starts talking to me about the gospel. And he says, well, it's interesting how many people can go through life, how many people can go through life in America, in the West, and never actually hear about the gospel. A lot of people conflate and think gospel is a style of music. So it's interesting that here he is, he has some understanding of God as he's shared and he's about to share, but he's never said he sat with the gospel. This is so fascinating to me. If you're gonna play P.O., you need to read the gospel. And so I'd never read the gospel and he's reading Matthew to so me. So you've never read like Nothing. the gospel of Matthew straight Nothing. through. Yeah, okay. that's, that's wild to me as a follower of Jesus. But if you sit back and really think about, you think about where you were at before you converted and gave your life over to Jesus. Had you actually heard the gospel? Because I feel like I heard the gospel a lot of times much more after getting saved than before getting saved, right? Sometimes even to the point where I, I don't know, I felt like I got resaved. I was the guy putting my hand up in church every single Sunday, giving my life to Jesus over and over, right? Saying a prayer over and over, right? All Sam Harris. I've watched all the TED Talks <laughs> yeah, right. and was really good at attacking Catholicism because it made me feel superior. So he says he watched Sam Harris, who's an atheist debater. He says he knows how to attack Catholicism and all the debates, but he's never heard the gospel. That's fascinating to me. We feel kind of agnostic slash atheist at the time. Yes, I'd like to, I'd like to argue because right. it made me feel like I was in power. Right. Man, the need to be right, the need to argue, not the need to be on the side of what's right. There's a difference, but the need to be right, the need to win every argument, so on and so forth. And he's telling you this straight up. That's, that's what time I was on. Um, I'd like to be contrarian. Yeah. I'd like to sit with a bishop and then put you on your heels because that would make me feel powerful, right. mm. uh, which I find most secular people enjoy, the control of it. Yeah. Woo! Because so much of life is uncontrollable. To feel in control feels good. So, sheesh. Wow. That's a gem right there. People want to feel in control. We see that today. People want to feel in control of dictating what other people can and can't say, what other people can and can't believe, what other people can and can't do with their own church gatherings, with their own families, with how your kids are going to get educated. It makes them, in a secular way, feel powerful. But if you think about it, it's actually the same thing that they're attempting to rebel against. That's a fundamental dogmatic thinking that's, I think, worse than just being a follower of Jesus, because at least that's anchored on a historical event, truth, church history, scriptures. This is anchored on whatever the society and the culture and whichever way the wind blows. It's fascinating. Uh, I was that guy. I'm gonna play you guys one more clip from this conversation, give you guys some closing thoughts here in just a second. There also happened to be like a meeting at the church for this other spiritual program that I'm in right next door to Sister Lucia's. So I'd wake up in the morning, 9 a.m., I go to my meeting and then 10 a.m. I'd be with Sister Lucia, and then 11 a.m. I'd be with Brother Jude, and then 12 I'd be with Brother uh, Father James, who's now in uh, mm -hmm. Berlin. But Father James was like this. Father James felt like an old sheriff. Right. I don't know if you met you met sure, Father sure, James. Sure, yeah. He's like this. He's like a grandfather. Right. His yeah. hand is enormous. Yeah. He made me feel safe. He would just put his hand on my shoulder mm. sometimes, and he wouldn't say much to me. He wasn't. But he was also like this Archie Bunker character, <laughs> where like his love felt like you had it, like like you were pulling it out of him. Yeah. He's always around, and I started falling into this group. And I'm living there, so I'm taking showers in, in there, and I'm eating with them, and we're hanging out. And, and they're I, drawing you into the, the Christian, the Catholic thing. They're kind yeah. of drawing you into the gospel, into a certain way but of But more life. than that, it's not even like they're trying to, they're drawing me into like laughter. Mm, they're like sharing yeah. jokes with me. It's like we're just like hanging out. 
And I, at this time, I had no friends in my life. You see, know? What, see, what did Jesus do with people when he first met them, typically? He'd eat and drink with them. You know, so you think of Jesus, well, he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. Well, yes, he does. But the typical move of Jesus was, well, let's get around the table and we'll, and we'll talk. Yeah. And he's talking to prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors and, you know, so that move of theirs, look, look, uh, you got, you got, you guys see his body language there when he said prostitutes, sinners, and he, and he, and he does this because he identifies as the sinners who religion feels are unworthy. He identifies with that and the fact that these people would talk to him. Draw you in. Yeah. Draw you into their life. Yeah. And I'm eating their ice cream yeah. and I'm eating them out of house and home <laughs> and I'm filling the tacos back up. But like, I'm really like, I'm, I'm, they're not asking nothing of me. They're not asking me to sign nothing. They're not asking me to do nothing or yeah. take pictures. I'm just like sitting around and I'm petting their cats and I'm hanging out, you know? Yeah, right. Here's the big idea. This is what I really want you guys to consider from this conversation. He goes into this from an egotistical standpoint. He's trying to get his career pop and he gets this role with these other famous actors. He's super duper excited. And in that he has to prep by being around the seminary and being around these priests and being around how they live and all of these different things. And he says it was through that that he just started to feel like he belonged. And I believe salvation can look very different in terms of which doors people go in through. For me, salvation is I kind of went in through the door of apologetics, but I've had friends that came to faith, not because I shared this perfect gospel sermon with them through taking them down the road of Romans, but because they just kind of came around, hung out, break bread, go to dinner, started coming to church. And before you know it, they were on fire for Jesus and wanting to pray over the food and all these different things. I've seen that happen. So it's not a one size fits all. We should absolutely share the gospel with people, but we should also live our lives in a way where people can feel welcomed and feel like they're a part of what we're doing because, see, they've done studies. And this is wild if you think about it. Consider the five people closest to you. Consider how they live. Consider what time they're on. Consider what they're doing. Consider even how much money they make. And what they found is the five people closest to you, usually the, the average income of those five people closest to you will on, on average be what your income is. That if they're all married with healthy, stable marriages, you're more likely to be in a healthy, stable marriage. That if all of them are fit, and they take care of their bodies, you're more likely to take care of your body. That if all of them love Jesus and are pursuing Jesus and going to church and active in church, you're more likely to love Jesus and pursue Jesus and, and do all these different things. And so I just think about Jesus when he says, hey, like you are the light of the world, right? No one takes a light and, and suppresses it. They put it up so it can illuminate. And so as followers of Jesus, are we considering the power in the relational aspect of this, in both sharing the gospel and being full of truth, while at the same time extending grace and mercy to folks that are going, uh, you know, on some, are in a really dark place. He, in a different part of this interview, talks about how he was considering self-deletion in this whole process, and these priests completely saved his life, you know? And I believe God is seemingly doing something in his brother's heart, and it's interesting to see what, what how this movie is going to play out. I haven't heard anything about this priest or I don't know anything about this. I just know what I saw in this interview. I found it extremely helpful. And I, one thing that I took away was, was that communal aspect of how powerful that could be for many of us, especially those of us from com that come from non-religious families. And all of a sudden we get around Christians and we're like, whoa, this is different. This is interesting. I like these guys. They are gracious and compassionate, yet they tell me the truth. There's a lot of power in our community, especially as things are starting to open up. I would encourage you as a, as a, as a Takeaway, consider what influence you have over the people in your life, over the gyms you go to, over the communities you're in. Consider that influence because you'd be surprised how much of an impact that influence can have. So guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you smash that like button. There's some other videos over here recommended for me and YouTube to you. You can check those out here and here. Check out the new channel we just launched called Bless God Studios. There's extended clips, long form podcasts, so much more. That will be linked up right here. It'll be over here, all right? So I'll see you over there, all right? Peace.